Hey everybody, welcome to another What the Tech. This is episode 92. I'm Andrew Zarian. I'm joined by Paul Therat, as I am each and, each and every week. How are you doing, Paul? Good. How are you? I- itch. Itch and every week. <laughs> yes. I don't know. I'm all, I'm all off from yesterday. I know. Uh, for people who don't know, I, I met Paul in New York City. There was a uh, Microsoft event uh, mm-hmm. that I did not make it to. I didn't go to the Microsoft event, but I met up with Paul and uh, Mary Jo was there and a few other people, actually. Yeah. I showed up an hour and a half late. We had quite a crowd by the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, the last Paul heard of me was like 1240 saying, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Yeah. And then I was in a, a restaurant where I didn't have a signal. So I didn't, you know, a certain amount of time goes by and you don't really think about it. And then after a while, I started looking at my phone just to see if I saw, had a message and I didn't. And then after a while, I said, well, maybe I should contact him. And then I realized I can't actually send a message. Oh, maybe something's wrong, you know. And it was right. It was just about that time where you actually walked in. Yeah, and then um, it was it was a whole thing. My cab driver got lost. He went to the west side instead of staying on the east side. Uh, it would have been a five minute walk if right. I had decided to just walk. I told. I think I told you this. Like I, when I arrived, I, I got hopped in a cab and I said, "The New Yorker, please." And he said, "Get out." Well, yeah. He said, "Why don't you get out and walk? It's right around the corner." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, "Okay." I didn't know where. It yeah, was. it was right by Penn Station. Um, yeah. But it was nice. It was nice seeing everybody. And uh, you guys had an event you attended. A, um, I still don't. And, and I spoke to you guys for a good mm-hmm. hour about what the event I was. No I still have no idea what the event was about. Right. <laughs> so, not, not a clue, actually. It was a, a launch event for the retail availability of Windows Phone in the United States. And which man- is interesting Mango? because are you only about- three devices are available so far and there are more coming. But a launch event for Mango or like a launch event just for the phone? Well, for the new. Yeah, the new okay. Mango generation of phones. OK. Uh, no, no news about uh, the Nokia phones. No, but I do know that this is not official or uh, publicly announced. But I know from my sources at Microsoft that's going to happen at CES in January. Oh, that's nice. A launch or like a de- like uh, like a debut of the new one. Both. Really? Oh, this is getting interesting. Yep, it's gonna be quick. You know, I was talking to Mary Jo for a little bit, uh, and we were discussing how it doesn't have a front, it doesn't have a camera, and the, the Nokia doesn't. The Nokia doesn't, and so I talked to Microsoft about that. Well, uh, she told me what they told her. And yeah, that what did pe- they say? I'm curious to see if this matches up. Can I? Can I? Say, uh, should I say it? I mean, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was public. Yeah. Um, they said that they didn't have enough time. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what Microsoft told me. They said, "Look, you know, uh, we made this announcement, and whatever month we had eight months to make this all come together. Um, the ch- the choice was: do we put out something that we think is a good phone for that particular market and we know people are going to complain about certain missing features, even though no one really uses those features. Or do we wait? Mm-hmm. And they decided they really need to ha- needed to have something in 2011. So the, that first uh, set of phones that they announced for Europe and for Asia won't have a couple of these features. But I, I, I actually agree. I mean, you know, the phones we saw yesterday, the ones we have here in the U.S. have these front-facing cameras. There's not even any software on the phone that can take advantage of it. So... I'm actually kind of unclear what the point is to begin with. So I, I really don't see that as a huge deal. Um, well, the fact that the N9 had it. And but the N9 had software. Okay, uh, yeah, I guess that's what words, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, w- something that's going to happen. Well, there are a couple of things that are going to happen in the coming months. I mean, you know, there'll be a Link client. I don't know if that will support the front facing camera or not, but Link is a very limited kind of a thing because only certain Microsoft corporate customers are going to use that anyway. And then there's going to be Skype, and that's going to be the big deal. And I, I, I don't know. Oh, sorry, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I assume that you know CES is the obvious launching point for a Skype client on Windows Phone. And by that point, we will have, you know, some number of phones here in the U.S. and I, you know, this uh, coming generation of phones from Nokia as well, which will have these features. So uh, I think it makes more sense to worry about that stuff when we actually have something to take advantage of it. So. I mean, I get it. You know, people yeah. like to look at these checklists, you know, does it have everything on it? And th- there are a couple of reasons not to be super impressed with that Nokia, which looked impressive seeing it. But now that we know more about it and you can put it in your hand and actually see what it's like, you start to recognize a couple of issues. And I don't actually think the front facing camera is a big problem. I mean, I think there are other issues with the phone, but I, th- I think the Nokia, 
the 800 is a beautiful phone. The 7, what is it? The 7, uh, 810 and 710. The 710 mm. is not impressive to me because there's so many other phones that are on the market that are Windows phones that are like better it. than that phone. Well, I, I think th so. I think there is a market for people, and, and I'm speaking specifically about young people, you know, teenagers and um, people in their early 20s who like to personalize their phones with different color cases and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think uh, there's going to be some of that. And, and I like that Nokia has customized the UI of the phone itself so that it matches the color scheme of these mm -hmm. uh, covers and everything. And I, I think that, you know, again, that's not for me, that's not a big deal, but I think for a lot of younger people, that is a big deal. So yeah. I, th I think between that phone and if you could sort of imagine an improved version of the 800 that checked off all those boxes we're, we're so concerned about. And then you add that to the, the phones we have already, the three phones here in the U.S. And then HTC uh, is coming with the Titan as well. Um, and the supposed or I, I should say the presumed availability of Nokia on Verizon, I, I think all of a sudden looks pretty good, you know. I think what? I think once they well, I think once they grab um, I guess once they grab the market on Verizon it's gonna we're gonna start seeing a different a, a shift in, in in a way because I have no problem getting two phones. Yeah, you know, I, can, I actually you know so I, I, I the two Samsung phones I have to say are really nice and the one thing that I the one thing I can include well one which of one the, the Focus the Focus S is that it, which is based off and of the, the Galaxy Focus Flash yeah okay. Which I saw both yes, uh, yesterday. Yeah. And they're, they're both beautiful, beautiful in their own way. I mean, uh, I, I came out of this iPhone 4S experiment with a couple of thoughts. You know, one of them was about the importance of a good camera. And, and the smaller of the two, the Focus Flash, doesn't have a great camera. It's a, it's a decent camera, but it's not, you know, it's a typical cell phone camera. Um, the Focus S, which is the bigger one, has a very good camera. It's not quite as good as the iPhone 4S. I... I uh, Tom Warren, um, who was also at, you know with us uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. had an HTC Titan, and that's the really big one that will be coming soon on H. Uh, I'm sorry, on AT and T, and that one had a phone that se I'm sorry, a camera that seemed to be very much like the one on the iPhone 4S in quality. You know, we did yeah. some side by side comparisons, took pictures of the same things, you know, zoomed in to look at the quality and, and and so forth and and those were very very close i think the iphone having a great camera is the best thing to ha happen to the market because now we're going to start seeing more and more people yeah get aggressive well, with with creating a new phone and we're even going to see better phone uh, better cameras on the lower end phones I, I think many people especially a lot of these marketing guys are not big tech guys they they want to sell a phone yeah. And what I see happening is people the, want the cameras. Peop, that's exactly where they're, they're yeah. going to be like, oh, they don't care about this other stuff. Yeah, you know what? Let, let's care. let's make a phone and put a really good camera on it. But forget about the hardware. We could we could just go slower yeah. in the hardware. Where's this thing? Uh, you, let me see if I can. Uh, I'm going to grab a couple. Of phones OK, here. but I, I do feel that it's going to start. It's going to start changing. Um, I think the Bionic was a was a massive failure for Motorola when they released that phone because the camera was awful. Uh and they've, well, they've kind of regrouped with, I believe the Razer has a decent camera and the Galaxy, uh, the Samsung, with the, the Galaxy Prime has a really good camera apparently. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, I guess the thing on Amazon, um, on uh, Android is it doesn't really matter if one of them stinks because we just move on to the next one. I mean, there's always yeah, the next six one. months, six months later. Yeah, this is a new flagship, so no problems there. But, um, you know... I, when I reviewed the iPhone 4S, one of the things I came out of was thinking was like, this screen is too small on the iPhone, uh, just a hair too small. And that wouldn't it be nice if you could get an iPhone that had a slightly bigger screen and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and you compare that to the Windows Phone stuff and Windows Phones typically have bigger screens. How big do you think the iPhone screen should be? I don't think they should go up to 4.3. I think like a, even no. a 3.9 or, or a 4 yeah. inch screen would be good. I think what I wrote, and I'm, I'm <laughs> it's funny, I can't remember exactly what I wrote, but I believe what I wrote was something that there seems to be a sweet spot that exists between those two, you know, between 3.5 and 4.3. So, yeah, but nobody's making it. Well, some people are. You know, there's like, um, you know, the original Focus was four inches, and um, that's a decent size. But the funny thing is, now that I'm, I'm just too big of a person. I'm just a big guy. But this little, I don't know, you know, how well this will come out, but iPhone 4S, which is the white thing with jig hair. You know, when you put the, um, it, it's funny on the face of it, it doesn't look like it's any. It looks smaller. almost almost exactly the same size. But it's not. It's actually, it's hard to explain. Um, let, me, let me see if you can see, like why. I mean, it's like. Um, okay, so the edges aren't as round on, on that. Yeah, one. yeah, it's this thing is a brick, and this thing has got tapered edges, and it's 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 way lighter. I mean, it's. 
probably a third lighter or, you know, a fourth, a quarter lighter or something. You can tell, really tell. But I have to say, you know, I don't think so much for me, but this focus flash, which is the small one, I think this would be a really good camera for, um, you know, for kids and teenagers and young people and for women in general. Well, it's going to be really cheap, right? And it's also only $50. I mean, you know? that, that's amazing. And it has a, a you know, the, a fast processor. It's got, a, you know, eight, it's only eight gigs of RAM. When we, or, look at, when we look at a year ago, the Kin was their $50 phone. Yeah. yeah. And now we're talking, you know, now we're talking about serious business. Uh, with and a it's $50 new. Phone. I mean, this is new, too. Yeah. This is not, you know, Apple sells a $50 phone, but it's, you know, two years ago or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's a new phone. It's isn't got that, all. It's got new internal components. It's, isn't that isn't that typical Apple mentality though? Like, oh yeah, our phone that's a year and a half old. It, it's it, it's the same price as the other phones that are just coming out, but it's much better. Even though it came out a year <laughs> and, and a half well, ago. Yeah, you know, for some people, I mean, I, I get the whole attraction to the Apple thing, but I, I have to say, you know, I, I like the bigger focus personally, and I, and I, and I actually think, barring any incredible move from Nokia now in in January, maybe I stick with the Titan, which is a really big screen. That's the one that has the. Um, I think that's the 4.3 inch screen, right? Or 4. Uh, point which one? The 4.7. It's huge. Yeah, it's yeah, a big, yeah. But it's it's a big screen, but the thing is really wafer thin. And th and that's true also of that Focus S. Um, that thing is considerably thinner and a bit lighter than the iPhone. You know, I've been and screaming. It, I've been screaming that 4.6 inches is way too big for a phone. And I don't know how I would. I'm going to, you know, yesterday I, I was saying and I was a month. It's just like blowing away all my theories about screen size. You know? I know. And, and this is the weird thing. Uh, yesterday I was saying how I'm done with Android yeah. and I, I came to the conclusion last night. I kind of need to be, have both. So when windows phone comes out, I'm going to grab a windows phone. Yep. Uh, I'll get, you know, I have, I have a family plan. I can, I could just put it on there. Uh, and I'll, and maybe I'll say that's for work and I'll also get the galaxy, whatever they're going to call it, the prime. Yep. After holding that 4.7 inch phone, mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? This isn't that big. Isn't that bizarre? And you know what? No, but I think what sells it is this: if if that device was as thick as the iPhone four, you wouldn't want it because that thing would be this yeah. huge slab of metal. And I right? think that's what it was. My my experience with a big phone, it was the the Thunderbolt, which I got rid of. Yeah. I played around. I'm like, this is this is awful. I, uh, you know, I I was surprised. This is I, I really felt like those big screens were too much, and I felt like these little screen devices were too little. And the, it's funny because the two that I kind of like here are like the ones that are on the extremes uh, for screen size. So but, I don't but know. But when we talk about when we figure out you know what these devices are, and they're pretty much replacing the computer in certain situations. Yeah, I think and the actually, more and more you know, we for start virtual keyboard use. Yeah, the more and more we start using these devices for more things we would do in front of a traditional desktop mm -hmm. or a laptop. We're going to need a large device. Yeah. You know, a lot of people, and it's still difficult. I, I mean, on a, even on the iPhone, I, I still fumble around the letters. I got big thumbs. So right. I need no, a I bigger phone. And, and same, right. I do too. And, and on the smaller Windows phone, I do the same thing. And, uh, you know, I have big gorilla hands and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I need a big phone. Well, I, you're a big burly stuff. man, Paul. I know. I'm just... Uh, yeah. Not not everybody. I, I'm like I, I'm an elf compared to you. <laughs> you are, I was sitting yeah, next yeah, to yeah. you, and and uh, I, I, he's gonna hate me. I forgot his name at the airport. At uh, at the airport. Uh, at, at the airport. Oh my god! At the train station. Oh, actually, I forget his name too. Okay. I, I you know I meant to. I'm so awful with names. Um. Regardless, you you and and, okay, and other people. I was tiny. Yes. Compared to you two. I mean, you guys tower over me. You're like you're like Vikings. <laughs> and I'm this little man from Europe <laughs> selling shoes. Right. You know, <laughs> and I'm li and I always think I'm like, I I'm you know, I'm not that small. I'm not I'm not a short guy. I'm five. I'm five ten with shoes. And everybody's sure, like six yeah, three. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that seems like that should be normal size. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm average. Damn it. Wasn't Matthew, was it? I uh, it could be. It was bad. It could be. I was in a daze yesterday, so I don't know. But the more and more we're starting to use these devices, the more and more we're starting to need a little bit more screen real estate. And if they are going to kind of base the next version of Windows Phone off of Windows 8, I wonder how many of those features that are actually on the computer are going to kind of branch off and go onto the phone. We all know it's not going to be an exact 
copy of Windows. I think they might have they probably learned that mistake last time. I don't I don't think we have to like stress too much over how exact it is, right? I mean, I think the important thing is that the same basic interface will exist across all these screens, you know, that we'll have something very much like this on the Xbox, we'll have something very much like this on a phone. And Do you think it's going to be shifted? I mean, like on the Xbox, is it going to be Windows 8 with an Xbox feel? Like, do we need to individualize and do we need to have its own identity on every platform or do we want to have it be the same? And I was thinking I, about I, that. I just think the core of it needs to be the same. I don't think it has to be exactly the same because these screen sizes and these device types all have their own unique properties and personalities and all that kind of stuff. And so there are UI conventions that make sense on a phone that may not make sense on a tablet or a PC that may not make sense on a HDTV or whatever. So... Obviously, they can't be 100% identical. That wouldn't make sense. But, you know, I, I think the notion of there being a family of products, you know, that share a common UI that, you know, where that makes sense is fine. And I think that's why Apple has been extremely, extremely successful because it's a common look amongst all of them, right? It's, it's that, that web OS kind of goes over and the next evolution in OS X is probably going to be more of a... Web, yeah. uh, web OS, uh, iOS feel because I'm looking at web OS on my screen. <laughs> I, and I think Microsoft is headed in that way. And to me, the biggest problem with Android is the fact that it's so s scattered amongst all devices. You have no idea what you're going to get. And yeah. now we're starting to see it more because the Nook tablet is coming out and it's a totally different look than what an Android tablet is. And the Kindle Fire is coming out and said, that's a totally different look than what Android is. And I, every, those, that might be the things I like mo best about those products. Yeah, and, but unfortunately, in my opinion, I think that's its downfall because it's so well spread. I, I would say in the case of those devices, um, obviously, there's going to be some application compatibility there, and, and you yeah. want that. And, and, and again, these are two companies that I don't know about the Nook, but I think Amazon is going to create a tablet that we kind of like. Well, yeah, no, I do too, but... But do you, you know, trust other men? Do you f trust HTC doing this? Do you trust no, I don't, no, Samsung? No, I don't trust any this? of these companies. It's um, no, <laughs> no. I mean, the problem is, if Android had some kind of an ecosystem that was like what Apple has, it almost wouldn't matter what the device interfaces look like because ultimately, all you care about is that the content the content works and that the apps run. And that they do so without any modification or worry. That you don't have to think about it when you go buy something. Um, until that happens, this fragmentation stuff is a pretty serious issue. I, I think Amazon has the ecosystem mm -hmm. to pull it off. And I actually, you know, for all for whatever it is that Barnes and Noble is doing, I would just say to people that aside from your preference with reading books, some of this almost doesn't matter because they will always have to go to a third party. To get a service yeah. so that this thing can play, you know, videos or uh, music or whatever. You know that um, Barnes and Noble does not own their iTunes equivalent. They don't own their you know video and TV and movie service equivalent. So they have to go to third parties for that stuff. And well, that will never be a nice integrated experience. It just won't. Did you listen to any part of that unveiling for the Nuke the Nuke the Nook tablets? <laughs> no, I mean that happened the day we were in New York. So I've only what. I've just read about it. It was a little weird because uh, uh, the CEO came out and his name slips my mind. Uh, and he pretty much did a, this is why we're so much better than the fire. Oh, oh no, and he needs this to This is do why that. we're better than the fire. And this is why we're better than the fire. But it made you realize why you like the fire a little bit more. Yeah, I, I actually, all right, I was going to say you could uh, go to each one of those points and explain why the exact opposite is true. Yeah. Um, the fire, you know, we don't have one to look at or anything, but I mean, just conceptually is the first Android tablet with that whole integrated ecosystem. Oh, you know, uh, by the way, I, I, I actually, you just reminded me to say this on the show. My mm -hmm. ship date is the 14th, not the 15th. Oh, is it really? My, 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 I guess delivery date changed. Oh, I, how do you know that? Uh, I looked on Amazon for the pre-order. I will look. If you look under your order, it says, um, you know, expected date. He, he was, you know, the guy from uh, Barnes & Noble was t talking about how uh, Aunt, the, the Kindle devices, the, and the Fire in particular, was sort of a, a delivery vector for Amazon services. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in other words, 
I'm not. I don't want to Kindle Fire because it's an Android device. I couldn't care less about that. Um, I want to Kindle Fire because it does all that stuff. This it does all the stuff that an iPod iPad does that I care yeah. about that I personally care about in a in a size and a form factor that I prefer. And this is the thing I complain but about. But these yeah. are still ebook readers, and they're yeah. It and does this that is too. this is where the separation is. They're kind of being sold still as ebook readers and not so much as a tablet like well, as that, a competitor in that market i know I'm they're not, still i'm not sure about the fire i mean i think the i know the nook you know, is doing that obviously they're going after their um their core market which is those you know the people who are readers but and it will do that um i'm not convinced that a uh an led screen is the proper screen no no for no it's reading not. to be honest no it's uh, not it's actually pretty bad for reading but i guess they have to do that right yeah, so I mean, I pre-ordered two of these Kindles, so I, I've got a Fire coming and then the Touch version. My, I really fully expect that I will continue reading books on a regular Kindle because I just prefer that for text. Uh, well, know? on the iPad, it's it's awful. It, it almost makes it. It's just wrong, and it's it's, yeah. it's potentially dangerous. Even I mean, <laughs> you know, if you're bad for your eyes and yeah. whatever. I mean, I, I um, the Kindle e-ink readers, and, and by the way, this would be true of the Nook as well because they have the same technology, is, um, is much truer to a um, you know, traditional reading experience and it's easier on your eyes. The best part of the, the, I guess, the speech was he said how Barnes & Noble has created the look of this device from the ground up. Yeah. And Am all Amazon did was copy the playbook and all i kept thinking was well i kind of like the look of the playbook <laughs> right i, I think like rim a, did a, a great job that works <laughs> yeah i'm like yeah i'm like rim did a pretty good job with the look i mean it working now that's a separate issue but the look is not a problem uh i just want to run through some of the specs uh for the nokia tablet uh the, the nokia nook, the wow nook. i don't know what's wrong with me today <laughs> no it's hard it's these names are all the same it's like amazon apple you know it's yeah. it's the same you know nokia nook I don't, I don't know what's the matter with me. Uh, the Nook tablet runs on Wi-Fi, has a 7-inch display, built-in microphone, web browser, email, uh, all that stuff. Hardware-wise, it's it has uh, 16 gigs of memory, twice of that of the Kindle, and uh, enables, enables users to add up to 32 gigs of SD RAM, which you can't do on the Fire. I actually think Fire. that's really good, and I wish yeah. that the Amazon one did that. Well, uh, Amazon is planning on cre uh, putting out a 10-inch one very soon, so I'm sure that'll have it. Uh, they're saying it's going to be preloaded with Netflix and Hulu on the device, which it hasn't. Oh, wait a minute. Do, do they have an app, uh, an app store on this? On the, the Nook one. Oh, it's um, going to. It, oh, like, it does not allow you access to the full Android marketplace. Right. Because they want all run. Right. So they have. Yeah. Let's see. How and they, this is they, the advantage that the Kindle has. Only selected. I, so. I mean, although, only selected you know, Nook, uh, Nook optimized apps by holiday. They hope to offer specific apps from third party developers. You know, this this is awful for them because they can't use the Amazon store. No, and it's, it's it's possible that for a lot of the people who would buy this thing, that's not a huge deal. You know, if you think about if your primary purpose is an e-reader, which I would say that this thing is, the ability of this thing to have some music on there and a handful of games like Scrabble and Angry Birds and maybe even a couple of episodes of a TV show or something. I think for a lot of people, that's fine, you know. Um, I just think that when you buy a device, whether it's this thing or the Kindle or the iPad or whatever, you know, you need to really consider and, and really consider that you're not buying a, a thing. It's not plastic yeah. and metal. You're buying into this ecosystem and you want uh, to make sure that everything you want is there. You know, the safest one is probably Apple still, even though their devices don't span the range of sizes and, and uh, you know, that I would personally prefer nor the low prices that anyone would prefer. You know, I think the reason the Amazon one is so interesting is because A, it's really cheap, and B, it's a little more portable. But I, I, I wish there were different memory size options. I wish you could expand the memory. Um, certainly, it's not perfect. Uh, it's the Lynch, uh, I guess, the CEO of, of Amazon is saying that the CEO of Netflix, Reed Hastings, said that HD movies look better on the Nook. Did it? <laughs> Which... Come on. I, I, I mean... Right. It, it was really petty. It was almost childish. And then it says, judge for yourselves. 
Uh, yeah, buy one of each. <laughs> yeah. Why Why don't you spend two hundred forty nine dollars an hour an hour device? Think that's actually how things happen. <laughs> yeah. If, <laughs> if you buy both, it kinds of add, it adds up to an, a super iPad. Just it also both. adds up to two more devices out in the market that can play yeah. Reed Hastings Company's content, which is really what yeah. he's shooting for. Uh, so I, I'm I'm interested in it, but I from the people that I've asked, everybody feels that the Amazon will be the better seller. Oh yeah. Definitely. Because you have access to everything on Amazon. It's, it's I mean, cheaper, <laughs> for starters. 50 bucks I mean, cheaper. Yeah. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. But I found it interesting that uh, they're really going after Amazon. I, listen, I, I, a friend of mine uh, mentioned the other day that we're heading toward a future where these big retail stores don't exist anymore. He said he fully expects in five years, I thought this was really interesting, that Best Buy would simply cease to exist. And his rationale is that a lot of the people who walk into Best Buy now, unless it's Christmas, are walking around the store and using it as an in-store, in-person place to test things out that they will then mm -hmm. buy electronically via Amazon. For a lot you know, cheaper. That, yeah, and I used to, you know, this is awful because I love bookstores, supposedly, but I used to walk through Borders with my whatever device at the time and use the Kindle website on Amazon.com to look up the books I was looking at and then buy them electronically from my Kindle. And I think, you know, I think people do do stuff like that. The, the thing for Barnes & Noble is I don't really care about Barnes & Noble uh, per se, except that now I sort of do because they're the only big one left. And, it, and it's a weird situation because in the past, the big complaint against Barnes & Noble and at the time Borders was, was that these huge box stores were putting all the local bookstores out of business. But now you kind of do want them to stick around. You, you, you do want at least one of these things around because if they go away, then there's no competition at all. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I, I would never buy a Barnes & Noble device of any kind. I would not buy into their little ecosystem. I would be very nervous that they will just disappear and that that stuff will cease to exist. Yeah, what happens if, well, I guess they would. Well, someone will buy it. I mean, they'll Amazon get. will probably buy them up. Yeah, maybe it could be Amazon. Yeah. But to me, Amazon is the safe choice. You know, the, one of the reasons you buy into the Apple stuff and one of the reasons you buy into Amazon is, again, the completeness of it, but also... The fact that they're just rock solid. They're going to be around for a long time. Yeah. You know, um, the Kindle stuff is really, I don't, I don't mean to say pay off, you know, uh, it's kind of a, an inside joke with my wife and I. It's like it's paid for itself, yeah, you know, yeah, which yeah. is a ludicrous thing to say. But that's um, how I convinced but her it's to gotten let better me. and better and better. And the devices have gotten better. The service has gotten better. Everything's gotten better. I the that that's one of my uh, the way I convince my wife that I'm not wasting money on all these devices I buy because I'll say, well, look, the review got you know, a couple hundred thousand views. So I made the money back in ads. Yes. I broke right. even. As a reviewer, you could make that. Yeah. Uh, that's right. all right. That's, uh, the only, my, the only I, time but, it worked uh, was with the Droid review, by the way. That's the only time a hundred thousand people watched. Oh, really? So, yeah. no, no, I, that's a fair enough approach. Um, from my perspective, I, I don't mean to put it like I'm making a stand, but I do think that by taking a certain stance here I could possibly be influencing other people and I take that seriously you know in other words I'm not buying one of these things because I'm never going to buy content on barnesandnoble.com and put it on a device um, and here's the reason why I can tell you why I hope it's logical and I hope it makes sense to people um, I don't I, I don't <laughs> disparage other people for choosing otherwise but mm -hmm. that's where I'm at it's just not going to happen um, I told, I think I told you the story when Sony came out with that e-reader they had years and years ago, I used to go into Borders and look at it and think about it. You know, I really wanted to buy it. I, I've always been a heavy reader, love books, and it just wasn't quite there, you know. And when Amazon announced theirs, I, I pre-ordered it insta inst instantly. The second they did, uh, yep, those are the guys who are going to But I wonder if that's, that, that's the fact that we're conditioned to kind of trust or like other companies more than other ones. No, no. I, I, Sony was a company, you know, we are now know they have blown the last decade. But, but in everything. That, at that point, I had nothing but good feelings for Sony. I had bought lots of Sony stereo equipment. Yeah. I still have these headphones or Sony headphones. I still buy Sony things. Like I still, there's still a part of me that believes that Sony is associated with quality, even though at this point in time, I think we could argue that that maybe is no longer the case. But um, it wasn't Sony. It was just this notion that Sony was an electronics company, not a book company, right? And that they may, this thing may not take off, and then what? See, I, 
I had uh, bought a few books through the um, uh, the Microsoft Reader thing earlier. Remember the thing that ran on PCs and pocket PCs and, and all that stuff? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It always seemed kind of precarious, you know, that you could buy some electronic. It wasn't like MP3. It's like MP3s will always work. You know, those are going to work everywhere. Um, some random ebook format that is protected with DRM uh, may or may not be supported yeah. in the future. So that's a little more precarious. That's something you need to take. A little more seriously. Well, doesn't Audible do that? Audible, uh, you can't. Well, I guess you could crack it in some way, but you can't listen on that on certain devices. Right. No, but but Audible is Audible, right? So, in other words, if you are into these, I, I suppose there's two routes you could take, right? If you really like listening to audiobooks, you could actually go buy the CDs and you could rip them yourself. Um, I don't know if you've looked at these things; they're really expensive. Oh, well, to get uh, the actual physical media? Oh my God! Yes, yeah, really expensive. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I was in a Barnes and Noble in Washington D.C. a few weeks back, and was holding a box in my hand of it was a, I can't remember what it was, but I want to say there were twenty plus CDs in this thing. It was a crazy <laughs> twenty four hours stuff. unabridged. Yeah, of whatever. It was just a book. It wasn't like the Bible or the encyclopedia. It was just it was some book, and it was forty dollars. And I thought, you know, that's insane. It, it, and uh, Audible is. Was the, is the only company that's really been successful doing this. Now they're part of Amazon. To well, that's, that because, makes, that that's makes because they're affordable, Paul. I mean, you try to buy an audio book on, on iTunes, and it's thirty nine ninety nine. some audio books. Oh, I would never, right. And that's, uh, and, 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 yeah. and that's crazy, you know, when it you're is, thinking. It's insane, yeah. $9 a month for Audible, and, you know, you could, I, I don't know, it's not that every month I'm buying a book from there either. So it, it stocks right. up, and I could just buy like two or three in one shot. Or I could spend $40 and get one book. You know, it, it's That's it's quite nutty. a chance. Forty bucks. I mean, when was the last time you spent forty dollars in a book that wasn't uh, a like a computer program? Well, I, I was I was an idiot uh, and I bought you know. I bought Artie Lang's Too Fat to Fish on iTunes when it came out for forty dollars. That's, that's a lot of money. Yeah, because I needed it now and Audible didn't have it yet. You by the way, this the, by needed. the way by the way this this portion of the show is brought to you by Audible. Right, our new sponsor. <laughs> I, I have no, a I mean, here look, well, okay, so actually, I, I guess in matter in terms of full disclosure, right? Uh, Audible often does advertise on Windows Weekly, so I'll throw that out there. But and they're an advertiser of ours too. Okay, yeah. so but that's beside the point. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a customer of Amazon.com, and I talk about Amazon and I talk about their competitors. I don't really uh, have a, a a personal stake in their success, other than the fact that if they went away, you know, I'd be worried about my stuff, I guess. But but again, you're uh, you're kind of you're kind of in the environment now. If you stick with Amazon and you know that they're going to be around for a while, and you're buying this fire, you're going to have the audio books there. You're going to have the Kindle books there. It kind I feel of like, I feel like with the Amazon stuff, that decision has been proven true again and again and again. Every time they announce a, yet another feature of this Prime shipping service, or you know, they bought Audible, for example, and brought that in. I mean. Uh, they announced the Kindle Fire, and and finally someone releases a, a tablet for the price that I always thought these things should sell at. Um, to me, Amazon just gets it right, you know, again and again and again. Yeah, um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about WebOS here. Uh, there's some some stories that are coming out that uh, HP is looking to sell it, which we've heard over and over again, but right. we haven't heard about who's interested in it. Uh, yeah. HP spent 1.2 billion dollars. In 2010, when they bought Palm, so about a year ago, when they bought Palm, they spent a ton of money on this thing, and now they're looking to dump it. Um, and it, and it's the the crazy part is that yeah. about right before the summer, they were discussing how they're going to incorporate this in every computer by 2012. I know. So you could boot up in WebOS, or you could boot up in, I guess, Windows. Yeah, they were going to dual boot. And people were starting. I mean, I know it's it's a crazy room, but they were saying, well, are they going to become like an IBM? Are they going to dump? Windows are they going to start utilizing WebOS more? And it's, just, it's so convoluted. And uh, it just went away. Poof, that never happened. Now yeah. we're hearing about the people that might buy it. And some of these names are a little wacky. I mean, according and this is according to Reuters, so it's not, you know, Andrew Zarian's blog of of nothing. Right, right. <laughs> it is important uh, to note that yeah. this is a fairly uh reputable place, news yeah. <laughs> source, yeah. They're claiming that uh IBM and Oracle are interested in this. I don't know how what they would do with this because they've had zero involvement in anything when it comes to computers or, or tablets in the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we've also heard that RIM, Intel, Amazon are, are all in the hunt also to buy this, allegedly. 
I think we had talked months ago about this notion that Amazon should buy them. You know, Amazon the, should. Amazon uh, should not use Android and should use WebOS. How I'm awesome a fan of it. By the way, I don't know if, if what you think of it exactly, but I love WebOS. I think I the too. idea. I do too. I, it, I, the, whole, the whole thing is right. You know, this, um, I think they call it singularity, you know, this notion of bringing all the services into one place. They have this web-based infrastructure. They have a, a, an HTML-based programming model, which always made a lot of sense to me. Um, beautiful UI, multitasking, elegant devices. You know, remember they had that, um, what do you call it, when you put the you put the device down on the little stand and it oh, charges? Oh, the, uh, the, 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 the stone The stone, yeah, yeah, yeah. The stone charger, yeah. Oh, God, that stuff is just, you know, it's beautiful. I mean, the guy who did all that, John Rubenstein, was uh, the guy who did the iPod stuff at Apple before he left that company to go to Palm. Um, it was all the right stuff. You know, it was maybe bad timing, you know, whatever. But I think it was premature. I think it was a premature release, and it was a Hail Mary by Palm to hopefully grab the market. I think they released this phone without... Well, they had no wireless carriers to speak of. Well, they had nobody. They yeah. didn't really have a, de a a app store that was developed, and it was un Still it was tough. it wasn't performing at the level that I guess the iPhone was because everything at that point was an iPhone killer, right? Every phone that come out is just the iPhone killer, and I think when you do that, it kind of sets yourself up to for failure. They uh, they did what Windows Phone is doing now, which was they they go a different route, but not just a different route to be different, but a different route to you know where they really thought, okay, well, what makes sense, you know? And they, I think they made all the right technical choices. Um, that first Palm Pre device was very slow; it didn't have enough memory, yeah. the processor wasn't fast enough, you know, maybe the OS wasn't optimized. And then the second and the second one came out, and nobody heard of it, even though they fixed all the problems. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, I'll never say anything bad about the system. I like WebOS a lot. Um, but I, I think also it was feel mishandled. like maybe the time has passed. I mean, yeah. whoever buys this thing, I would if it's if it's a company like IBM or Oracle, I don't know what the heck they're not coming. We know they're not coming out with a device, so uh, they would buy that maybe for Palm's patent portfolio, which has got to be extensive. Now, does a uh, name does a name Palm yeah. also come along with this, or is that is or is they're, they're, they, onto I it? would assume so. Yes, I mean they sound the whole. A, package. it's going to be worth half or less of what HP. I mean, this is going to be a fire sale. And then B, yeah, why else would you want it? You know, no one's, I mean, uh, you could probably sell it to a Chinese company or, well, RIM maybe, or someone who could actually sell devices. Yeah, but, but RIM has their new operating. They have Q, QNX, and th I think they just renamed it to uh, yeah, I, one of the guys. Or B, yeah, BBX or whatever it is. Somebody in the chat will correct me. But they. Yeah, the thing's going like gangbusters, you know. But it's very so. <laughs> similar to WebOS if you compare it. If you compare the operating yeah. systems, the look and the feel, it like kind of. Like Linux based. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it has okay. a very similar feel to me, uh, for, at least for me, what I'm using. I, it, I don't know how you would find this now, and, and most people listening to this probably don't care, but if you were a developer, um, there's some great developer videos about how you write applications for the system, and it's really pretty simple. And they had a beautiful what you see is what you get kind of editor, and they had all this neat stuff that just nobody really kind of knows cared. exists. Um, but I think the window's closing. You know, we're... We're reaching a point where, just as in the PC industry, there's only going to be a couple of major players in these markets. Um, the question is whether it's going to be two or three. Yeah, it's only going to be a handful. You're going to have yeah. six or seven or eight of these. Yeah, in and the it's market. going to be Apple and Android and someone else, and it maybe RIM, maybe Microsoft, but it's not going to be WebOS. It's that's never going to happen. I don't. So. I don't think RIM is going to go away. I think RIM is going to hang on for at least another. I don't know. You know, these things have a way of spiraling. Like yeah. um, uh, Nokia's Symbian business has dried up dramatically, and they used to be dominant. I think that once businesses, high-end enterprises, and governments stop going, uh, start going more iPhone, which they are already, and even Android, then their only reason to exist goes away. I, I don't know. I think people still want to hang on. <laughs> I think that, but there are going to be some people. They're going to say, "Well, no." Uh, we 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 we're, come we're, to the light, we're invested, and this is why you know, and this is why a lot of companies are still running XP. They don't they don't want actually. Change. So I think, why, but let me ask, um, why would that's if more you're, like uh, inertia? You know, <laughs> it, it's it's not so much like an investment as it is like a fear of change, and we're not going. to, You know, um, at some point, I, I think smartphones, in particular, because of the way they're used. Uh, deteriorate more quickly than do um, PCs. And more importantly, the services that you get over these phones are more 
uh, common across devices. I mean, any device can get your email and do so securely. Yeah. Uh, any device can access. Well, they're all doing a pretty good job at this point. Well, that's what I mean. So, you know, why pay? Why why go through this BlackBerry thing? And you're the people who use these things are not asking for Blackberries, by and large, right? They want iPhones now, or they all want iPhones, iPhones, but they're getting the black. <laughs> they're getting BlackBerry. Well, I worked. I worked a at lot a company. Of them are getting iPhones. I mean, you know, companies are caving. I, I I worked at a company and, and they had a very large sales team and every one of the guys that were, that was on the sales team would get a new phone every year, and every year they would get a RIM phone and when I was there I was telling them I'm like well you really don't need to go with RIM anymore I mean they're not they're not connected to this large you know uh, exchange server it was they were just regular sales reps that wanted a phone to do email yeah, they had and like hotmail or something yeah like, yeah it was it was really phone. it was really and my job was to kind of bring everything together. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I got laid off and that never happened but the guy I th- we're talking about like 90 reps yeah. every year 90 people get a brand new phone really every year every year every year this, it was it, bizarre to me hmm. they the last time I was I'm like well you could go with Blackberry you could go with an iPhone it doesn't really matter I don't even think you need to upgrade every year you could just let them use the phone yep they ended up doing it again, and they all went with RIM. And I was speaking to the sales rep, and he goes, the guy that kind of took over for your job was telling him, get an iPhone. They all want iPhones. And the bosses and the company was saying, well, no, that's not for business. Blackberry's for business. Okay, but that's... <laughs> and, and I'm thinking... Yeah, it's I'm like, an out-of-date out mindset. I mean, But I wonder how many of these companies think that way. And I, I wonder how many people are, are going to stick with RIM because RIM is the corporate phone. I just think it goes away. I think the people begin to understand over time, you know. People are going to, will demand those phones too. They're not demanding Blackberries. You know, I'd like to limit my my view to this little tiny postage screen. You know, postage stamp size screen, not not this beautiful huge touch screen. Can I have this little dicky thing? You know, I mean, that's not what people are asking for. Yeah, well, I'm wondering what the next uh, OS is going to be like on that phone. I think there's going to be a big, big I don't surprise. Think it I, I, so you think RIM is going to go away? Obviously, Windows Phone is going to survive because. They're kind of it's, it's it's a matter of whether they have two or five or ten or maybe twenty percent of the market, right? I yeah. mean um, we'll see. Well the obviously Google's gonna grab majority of it because they have the most phones on the market. So it'll be Google, it'll be the iPhone, it'll probably be Windows Phone, and maybe something else if that. I think that that's gonna be it. And and I, I think for the people that don't make iPhones, which is everybody. Um, they want an option. You know, they want, I think that alone says there has to be a third choice. So um, it's no coincidence that the world's two biggest an- makers of Android phones, HTC and Samsung, are both major Windows phone licensees and the two companies that just released new phones in the United States. So um, that shouldn't be surprising. You know, you, those companies can't put all their eggs in one basket. So they, for them... They want the benefits of competition that yeah. will lower prices for them and, and lead to better products, whichever one of these things takes off better in the market. We're going to see. I guess the waiting game now, right? <laughs> We're going to wait. It is while, waiting. while we wait, why don't you tell us about uh, Call of Duty? Oh, man, that's awesome. So you, you, what time did you go in line and get it? I had an awful experience last night. Um, we live in this town, Dedham, where Dedham does not allow certain things to happen after midnight. Um, it's very puritanical in that way. Okay. So, for example, w- there's one Dunkin' Donuts in Dedham that's allowed to stay open all 24 hours a day. But if you go in between midnight and, I don't know what time, 6 or 5 a.m., you ha- you can only get food that you can eat on the premises. You can't take it to go. I, I was going to say, I thought you were going to say uh, you were judged. No. <laughs> if you went in between those. So Dedham's weird. So what's happened over the years is all of the midnight events that I've gone to um, you know, for the various Halo games, for various Call of Duty games, whatever it is, I have to drive to some other town because Dedham will not allow these stores to stay open. Okay. So last night, my son and I left around 1130 and I said to him, I said, let's just drive by the Dedham Best Buy because you never know. And when it's closed, we'll just keep going and we'll go to the, you know, we'll go down to Brockton or whatever. And we pulled into the parking lot and there were all these cars there. And I thought, well, that's great. So, um, but it took, we didn't get out of there until 5 past 1 a.m. Wow. So we were there almost an hour and a half. And these guys were just clueless. I mean, they were really nice, but they had never done it before. And they were moving really slow. They had two registers open. 
Eventually they opened other registers in the other part of the store, but then they took people from the back of the line instead of the people who had been there the longest. And so it was just, I was ready to just go postal on somebody by the time this thing ended. But anyway, it turns out it was worth the wait because this game is actually better than I thought it was going to be, which I'm really surprised to even be able to say. I mean, you spoke, you spoke highly of it last week. Um, well, well, Call of Duty in general is great, but this one... But you, you kind of know, know it was going to be a good one because Modern Warfare 2 was well, an a- not, awesome nothing game. Nothing is ever definite. You know, um, Infinity Ward imploded last year, and most of the people involved with this game left the company. And Activision had to bring in two other studios to finish it. So they brought in uh, Sledgehammer to finish the single-player campaign. And I think they brought in Raven to finish the multiplayer campaign. So... Sledgehammer is a new company. I don't even I don't know anything about them. So who knows? Well, you know, we don't know how far along it was, and you know, who, who knows who knows how it's going to turn out. Um, I'm only about a third of the way through the uh, single player campaign as I speak, and you know, level fourteen or fifteen or whatever it is on the first you know round of <laughs> or first um, you know prestige level, whatever uh, on multiplayer. But I can already say it, it's really impressive. And the the way to say this is, and this goes back in time, but. If you think back like 30 years to movies, um, action movies would always build to this big sequence at the end where mm-hmm. there was this incredible set piece where that was the, the whole point of the movie, right? You know, like the, um, you know, the subway, the, the over-the-head over the rail sequence in The French Connection or something. Um, one, of the, one of the many things that the Star Wars movies kind of innovated with movies was this notion that it can be like this unbelievable collection of set pieces, you know? And I remember my dad telling me, uh, during the Return of the Jedi, when that movie came out, that that whole opening sequence where they it ends with the sail barge exploding and they fly away and everyone's safe and everything, he said to me, he kind of leaned in and he said, "If this was any other movie, that would have been the end of the movie, but that's just the beginning of the movie, <laughs> you know." Yeah. And and that's kind of what this game's like. I, I, I all of the Call of Duty games have these kind of neat set pieces and actually not so neat set pieces. You know, some of the older games have these sequences where it's like a driving sequence and you just you just want to get through it. It's terrible, and you keep dying, and, and you don't know what's going on. But this one, I am already, and again, I'm only a third of the way through. I can't believe how many of these set pieces have already been in it, and they're all incredible. But it it's is, continuing the original storyline, right, where the Russians have invaded the states and they're yeah, still fighting. Yeah. Okay. And that's the one of the things that sets it apart from Battlefield. So Battlefield Three is also this modern warfare type of scenario, and in that case, the World War Three is broken up, but we're at war with... Um, Iraq. Um, it, there's no sense of immediacy in that game because most of that game occurs in Iraq. I'm sorry, not, uh, not Iraq, Iran. Iran. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great looking and, and it's, it's okay for what it is, but you don't have that sense of immediacy. And then in this game, uh, a lot of it takes place in the United States and actually they branch out. So there's a part that's in London, there's a part in, uh, in Paris, Paris now. Yeah. Um, but, a, you know, one of the first sequences is you have to get the Russians out of New York City. And, of course, in the last game, they had set off, you know, they destroyed Washington, D.C., which is sort of disturbing. So there's this real sense of drama to it. Yeah, because and, it hits um, it hits close. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it's more effective as a result. Um, the story is great. But, again, these set pieces, these incredible sequences, you know, um, that are just amazingly well done and fun to play. And, you know, the big – and, again, I, I – Battlefield 3, I, I said, like, I, I got to get through this, you know. Um, there were a couple of sequences where it's you would die, do it again, you would die, and do it again. And you say, you know what? If this happens a couple more times, I'm done with this thing. I give up, you know. I just don't care. And this game, I've never even come close to that. I mean, it's I, I want, in fact, today, I, you know, I said, well, I'm going to spend some time in single player. I got to switch back to, to multiplayer. I want to I really even it out. Um, I can't. I didn't. I I played single player all day today after staying up till four o'clock. Because it's, it's that you know. good. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. The, the story is great. It's I mean, really, really well done. I'm, I'm reading. I, I read a little bit about the story today and I'm, and I'm reading. I'm like, wow, this this is really interesting. I'm like, I kind of want to play just for the storyline. Yeah. Just because it, the story it, it really is great. I, I'm, it's impressive. I mean, I still I feel the same way about multiplayer in that I don't know how someone new to this game could ever pick up this multiplayer and be successful at it because it's so complex now with all of the perks and challenges and, um, and all the stuff they have, you know, the, the level ups and the, the, the loadouts they have, they have, um, attack packages now for, 
you know, the things you can add to your class and all this stuff. And it's, it's very complex. See, and, and that's my problem because I haven't really played, I played, uh, I think I played, uh, the, the older, not, not the last, uh, modern warfare, but I guess the one before that. Yeah. Uh, I played that and I own that one. And I, so, I, I had a difficult time because I haven't been playing these games for a while. Uh, and, yeah. and going into it, it was a little bit difficult. I could that was only the imagine. first one that actually added the complexity. Yeah. See, that, that's the problem. And How that do you one, get I into blew it? it? Because uh, back then, my son and I shared an account, and he would play multiplayer. So I would just play single player. So you know, during the day, I would play single player for a little while, and then he'd come home from school or whatever, and he played multiplayer for a little while. And then eventually, I finished the game, and I said, well, I'll just jump in, and I'll, I'll play multiplayer. I'm good at this, you know? But he had leveled up everything. He had all these special gun loadouts and all this stuff, and uh, this stuff had never existed in Call of Duty before that game. So I got into this thing and I, I almost there was a period of time where I was almost not going to do it because it was just too I couldn't believe how complicated it was. Yeah. And I finally it was stuff like, I don't remember these specifics, but I remember him explaining things to me. I would say, I don't know. What is this thing? Like, how do you how do you know? That oh, you, dad. You know, yeah. I mean, it was really very complex and it's only gotten more complex. So know? how so, does someone like me that wants to get into this game? What do I do? How do, you do it? I would start with that one. So Call of Duty 4, you know, the first Modern Warfare. Yeah. If you if you put that in your Xbox and hopped online, there would still be plenty of people playing that. And I would just get used to it and understand how you level up, how the weapons get better, how the perks get better, you know, all that stuff and get used to it. And then after a while, I would try going to the second one. Because They're going to have to do this in the games itself. Yeah. They're going to have to eventually, you know, like I'm just starting out. So here is a simpler version of the game for you to lead so, up to. I don't want to get too involved with this because I could go on and on forever. But there's an additional complexity to this because the way that the Call of Duty games work is that every other game is made by a different studio. So Modern Warfare 1, the first one, was followed by World at War, which was a World War II game yeah. that was made by Treyarch. And then. Modern Warfare 2 came out, you know, by Infinity Ward. And that was a follow-up to the previous Modern Warfare and not to the one right before it. You know, so they kind of leapfrog each other. And what's interesting is there are differences between the games. And, and Treyarch actually uh, makes improvements that I really appreciate that, that are then missing from the next game because Infinity Ward never went back and took anything good from Treyarch. <laughs> you know, they, yeah. they sort of were competing internally. Um, and I, again, I don't want to get into all those differences, but... It's funny because every other year a Modern Warfare game will, uh, will come out now. And it's like, oh, right, this is how they do assists. This is how they do that. Like, they're, it's just a, some of the things are just different. And it adds to the complexity. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's such an awesome look. By the way, the commercial, yeah. I really like the commercial. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah and, the funny one. So they did one of those for the last game, too. And that could, have been, that could have been a Super Bowl commercial. It's that good. I know, but of course the timing is... And the of game, course too. the timing of the game... Is on, and I was like, I'm like, wow, you know what? This this belongs. Like, I, I could just see it, you know, during a Super Bowl, this debuts, and you're like, wow, this is the commercial of the year. My, uh, my son always makes fun of me because I'm like, because uh, you know, I'm like the noob tuber, you know, like, yeah. and, and I always, I always joke. I say, oh, I don't understand what the problem is, you know. I, I'm like, it's um, what else would I kill noobs with, you know? So we we're watching this commercial, and then at the end, Dwight Howard comes out, and he's like, woo, and he's like at the noob tube thing, and uh, Marco's, he's like, points at the screen, he goes, that's you, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> We were talking about this yesterday, and I'm like, you know, traditionally, yeah. the father, you know, when the father loses to the son in basketball or like baseball, the son is better than him in, in like a sport. That's yeah. when the torch is passed. In your case, and in and in the case of many people now, it's when your son beats you in modern warfare. Oh, that, he dances on my grave too. He's unbelievable. It's such an amazing looking game, though. I mean, it, it really, for someone like me that was really into gaming, and then I stopped, and I haven't really been committed for a good seven or eight years uh, it's tough uh, so this makes me want to get back into it though this the and uh, the arkham city game, the previous game had the notion of a um can't remember what they called it but it was like a beginner's lobby you know so if you were of a certain level you could you could only play against people who were also starting out like you and that made it a little bit easier right because if you didn't know what you're doing you could do well in there but uh, still but, the game is complicated yeah but modern warfare has not uh does not have that so or at least I don't think they do. Maybe I, I'll look at that. But. I'm looking at the uh, the demos now. A lot of people, it just, you know what's interesting? There was nothing this morning. No gameplay. It was very little. And now it's all over. People are uploading everything. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. It, you know, for me, I'm like, everything is just so fast. It's just way too fast. 
This is, you know, uh, assuming the game goes well, and it has, it's been better than I thought it was going to. You know, I look for, I look at something like this, and I think, oh, this is like the next year, you know. Um, they always have these different, like, prestige levels, and they'll have uh, various deals, the downloadable content, things like uh, map packs and so forth. And this is like the next year, you know. Um, that's the way it's been with Call of Duty since Call of Duty 2, I mean, since the Xbox first came out. I mean, every year, you know. That was the year. Call it that very first game, Call of Duty 2 on the Xbox. They released several map packs for that thing. Um, and it just kind of kept it going. And uh, they learned their lesson, like we can keep people um, engaged here. Well, you Not know just what else? One uh, month, but for the whole year. By looking at this, I, the Xbox has been around for, you know, quite six, a few years now. Six years. Yeah. Six years. We're kind of, I mean, this is it for as far as how good these games are going to kind of look, right? No, this is absolutely true. If this is it. At, yeah, Gears of War 3 and Battlefield 3 and Call of Duty, or Modern Warfare 3, oddly enough, all threes. Um, yeah, we've reached a pinnacle. You know, it, we, we've, they're not any better looking than the games that came out last year. Yeah. I think we've, they're great looking, you know, for what they are. But it's true that for, the, for Modern Warfare 3 and Battlefield 3, I suppose, if, um, if that's what you care about the most... You could, if you had a really high-end gaming PC, you could actually have a better-looking game than's possible on the 360, and that's yeah. something that's going to have to change. So, well, uh, I think Microsoft. There was a leak. Did, did you see that leak roadmap? Yeah, that doesn't um, actually jive with what I know <laughs> about the next yeah. Xbox. So I'm not really sure what to say about. Oh, that. about the name you mean? The loop? about a lot of it about it being based on Windows 9, about you know whatever, but. Um, it, I, it doesn't really matter. I mean, yeah. the specifics don't matter. But the roadmap, I I was reviewing it on, on Tech News Weekly on Friday, mm -hmm. and the roadmap was a little off when I was looking. I'm like, well, it seems like they're, they're planning an early release for Windows 8. They're saying by, um, I think they said by September, yep. Windows 8 is going to be out, which I believe you had said that, and that's what they had said, that they were hoping to have it released a little earlier than uh, the previous you know, Windows 7. But right. Windows 8 goes back to November release. And I'm like, I'm like, you know what? Okay, fine. I can understand that. But for a, you know, Windows 8 is a major revamp. If you yep. consider what Windows 7 is. And it's being done in a shorter time span. We'll see. <laughs> but uh, yes, I mean, according I mean, supposed, to this. Yeah, so so far, I, don't, yes. I don't know. I, I, I did the roadmap. And enough, after I did, I'm like, eh, you know what? It's a little off. I'm like, at least I didn't say that this is it. But who knows? But I, I, I do think that we have reached, I mean, the end for as far as what the graphics are going to be like on these games and how they're yeah. going to look. I mean, they look great. You know, if you have a, a 1080p display. Oh, it's phenomenal. And it's 50 inches big or whatever. These games are going to look awesome. And they I think that's are. what gave it its lifespan. I think that's what really yep. made the Xbox. You know, it's going to be around for at least eight, nine years, at least 10 yeah. years. I mean, they're still going to have to develop some games for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's not. It, you know, things don't just stop, you know, uh, of course. But um, when before, I mean, we're looking at a three year cycle for a console. Yeah, And this will be a 10 year. Yeah, essentially. Right. And nobody's buying a PlayStation. So who cares what it is? <laughs> well, although, you know, uh, I have to I probably won't do this. But, you know, I everything I've read about that game Uncharted 3 on the PlayStation 3 suggests that this might be one of the single greatest video games ever made. But nobody and owns a stupid console. I, well, well, some people must. I have, I have it. I have, I have yeah. a PS. Oh no, I do too. But I never really use it. I play occasional Blu-rays on it, but um, I don't know. Probably not. But uh, now I'm looking at the it, video. I'm all, I'm all looks, committed to these. Looks fantastic. This looks great. I want to buy it. I'll <laughs> play with resist. you, Paul. We'll play. <laughs> all right. What do you do, Andrew? What are you doing? I'm playing with Paul Therat. <laughs> Deal with it. I'm playing with Paul. He's teaching me how to blow things up. Paul, yeah, can Paul come out to play? Uh, so you're liking it. You're going to be committed to this for how long? Uh, for a year. I mean, I, you know, I, this is, this is what it's going to be. This is the game. This is it. Okay. The last, uh, the last thing I did before I went to this, before I woke up my son to go to the store was I played my last game of Black Ops. And, uh, <laughs> and that was that. And then, you know. Are you, are you done with you're done with Black Ops? This is totally replacing. Yeah, I mean, it? occasionally we go back and we'll just you know there all these games you know World at War, which was that last World War II one, um, Modern Warfare Two, and then now Black Ops all have these multiplayer levels that don't exist on the other games that you sort of miss. I mean, there's some great there's every one of them has some classic levels, 
And as you run around this game, and there's a lot of stuff in here that's reminiscent of Modern Warfare 2, which makes sense. Um, you see some of the same elements, you know, these chickens in cages and little uh, East or, uh, Middle Eastern market areas and stuff. It's a kind of similar design because it's obviously of the same family. You're reminded of these levels that now you haven't played in two years or three years or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, for, I mean, for the most part, that's the end of that. So, I think I'm going to buy this. <laughs> I think I'm going to buy it. You should buy it. They, yeah. I don't think enough people have bought it. Really? You, th you don't think? You no. don't think? No, I think it's going to be the best. I was going to say. All time. Well, I, they said some places here are sold out. I know. I know uh, a few of my friends went to go get it, and they were sold yeah. out. The last game was the single best-selling video game of all time, and according to Activision, this game, the pre-orders were like four times as strong. Wow. So it's it's conceivably. The, and there were bonuses, right? If we pre-ordered. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, in, in the only thing I saw here was that. Um, they had like raffles and stuff for people that pre-ordered, but I think there were like electronic, um, you know, unlock things you yeah. could get pre-ordered or whatever. Excellent. Looks really good. Paul, I think we got to wrap it up though. Did we miss something? I feel like we missed something. Did we miss something? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Google TV. Google <laughs> Cable. That's what we missed. I still haven't. Well, I haven't installed it yet, so. Uh, oh, that's what I want to actually, actually, you don't, you don't do the update. I completely forgot about. It. I'll do it when we get off here. I'll do it. Do you have the blue, the, like the Sony Blu-ray, like the Sony TV? I have the Sony TV. Oh, okay. Yeah, you you have the update, and it's been pretty good. The reviews, people are really liking it. It looks good, but I, you know, again, I I think I'm just at the point where I, I don't know that I need yet another device thing like that. You know. Yeah, uh, I have not received an update. I don't know when the Logitech boxes are getting it, and and I find that funny because I think the Logitech boxes sold the most. So I think it sold like 40 of them. Yeah, exactly. But I, I, I thought the Sony TV was going to be such a safe choice. And see, we were talking about Sony earlier. This is a, a fallback to that way of thinking. Um, I think it's a 32-inch screen. I thought, well, if this Google TV thing stinks, fine. I'll just use this to play video games. It'll be great. But the refresh rate on the TV isn't fast enough. You can't play video games. They're... Um let me pull this up again because I lost it. But they, the, the rumors are coming out that Google's interested in getting into the cable game. And I wonder if this is the direct response to Microsoft getting those partnerships with the cable companies and having cable oh. pretty much on, on the, the Microsoft Xbox. Xbox. Sure. But in reality, what I think they are doing that anyway, right? Google has... They don't need to have a cable service that you subscribe to, but you could pretty much have it on the Google, Google TV. is already into TV as strongly as Microsoft is. Yeah. So uh, I'm just curious on, on what they plan on doing with this. Uh, they're looking to get into the high speed internet game, which we know it's a very little market they're in right now. Uh, right. Now they're looking for TV, but for cable, cable TV, I, I don't know if this is necessarily going to work, but I think what this will turn into is just partnerships with networks where you get it on Google TV, much like, on uh, the Xbox. But the Xbox is not the networks you're getting to deal with. It's the actual cable company. Yeah. <laughs> I still, you know, we still don't I, know. I, exactly. I still have a hard time understanding where this is coming from. So I'm, I'm dying to see this update, um, this coming dashboard update, just so I can understand. You know, uh, we both have Fios. What do we get? You know, what's, what's, what's the deal? I mean, some stuff you get, you know, for example, if you subscribe to HBO, you can access that HBO to go service or whatever they call that. Yeah. And that's separate from cable, right? It's, it's something that's a private thing between you and HBO. Yeah. But you know what Google did? Google's now doing these ne these major deals with the networks for that YouTube, I guess, their, their YouTube TV stuff. Right. Right. So right, right. if you look at it. They're going to incorporate this directly with that. So you could have CBS Live on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And it's going to have commercials via YouTube. And this is, so this is, this, this is, is like an IP based delivery system yeah, for yeah. video. And it's, it's probably, like, it's going to be, you know, you just buy the device. But this is what Apple wanted to do, and the network said no. Right. It, it, it's fascinating to me how this is kind of going this way. And what does this do to the cable companies that have this relationship with? The networks. If I could get local CBS programming, and let's say I could get all my local programming on this device, plus 
okay. all the basic cable stations, and they're you know there's. Oh, you, by the way, the day that happens, every one of these cable companies is going to go out of business. Oh, they're done. You know, they're, I mean, well, why would you? They'll sell internet access because that's how you'll get it. And then they'll start having they start having deals with these companies. Like you have Discovery, and Discovery has I don't know, let's say ten channels, right? Right. All of them are playing either uh, World War II stuff or Aliens. Right, which is awesome, by the way. Both great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I had a I have a a friend that got cable really late. His father, yep. and like he we we were in our twenties. The father bought got cable, and he's like, I don't understand the big deal. I'm like, What do you mean? He's like, Every channel I put on, it's the Nazis invading Poland. Right. I'm like, well, what are that, you talking that about? Content and, is basically in the public domain. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, oh, that's probably yeah. why. But he ended yeah. up canceling it, and he got, you know, he has. I don't know what he does actually with the cable. See, he to me, that I, that would be a reason to never leave the TV. You know, I love that stuff, and I'm at a different screen. Hang on. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> you, I, you I, are wearing something different. I, it's magic. And are not, and are not I, moving. I, I love that stuff, and I think if I could get the Discovery channels, you know, Discovery and History and all that stuff, yep. in one, you know, everything is there. Everything is live, and it's all IP based. It's all high def, or as close to high def as possible. Yep. I would probably cut the cord. I would have cut the cord years ago. The only reason we have cable is because we have kids. Are they? Do they watch that much TV? Oh yeah. I. Yeah. I don't know. It, well, there's two issues. So one is um, a lot of the stuff they want to watch is you know we DVR stuff for them. Mm -hmm. and that's fine. The other one is you know my son's deaf, so he requires captioning, and okay. captioning is not routinely available on everything. Although yeah. it's getting way better. Um, you know, we get most of the movies you rent on the Apple TV now have captioning, which is incredible. But, you okay. know, cable, you can do on demand for renting and those always have captioning. Uh, virtually everything on cable is captioned. But you don't so. know what you're going to get if you, you know, do something. Uh, well, Netflix didn't have captioning until very recently. And the, the, new, Roku, the new, Roku de hello, new Roku devices offer that. Although, by the way, uh, they never announced it and there's no way to find out which movies have it and which don't. But Apple TV's version of Netflix has been updated and also supports captioning. Um, so that's nice. I mean, it's not very well documented, but it's there. So, I mean, these things are sort of evolving, but, um, you know, when he was, little, especially when he was a little kid and he's learning to read. and He didn't you know, really but, have, you guys didn't have the You're not going to screw around with that. I mean, yeah. you want him to be able to see stuff, so. I, I guess that's, a, yeah, I guess more with that, too. Uh, it's a reason. Uh, I know YouTube does the captioning. Yeah. Not, that was not a big great. Deal for him. He spends a lot of time on YouTube um, watching, like, Call of Duty videos, actually. But, but, but um, what, is, I mean, do they, does he watch, like content online is that yep because i'm wondering how this gen you know the the young generation that's coming up now what yep. where they're going for media and i know many people are are going Controller. online and they're watching it online but how yep. much is going on how many of that a lot of it <laughs> actually yeah. i mean i would i if i was a teenager or college or whatever i would have a laptop connected to a big screen and i'd be pumping stuff out to that and uh it would be downloaded stuff or whatever you know all, all these sites hulu and um all the uh you know the network station you know the networks have their own websites where you can put these videos on and i wouldn't have to watch the new show on thursday night or whatever night yeah. it debuts you can watch it the next day for free from the web i'm looking here they're showing uh i'm at the sneak peek of what i guess content they're gonna have on this thing <laughs> Uh, yeah, more I'm, great I'm, content I'm, creators. So you, here you could sign up for a sneak peek of what it's going to be. But pretty much it's yeah. it's a mix of, I guess, stations and YouTube channels. Yeah. Which yeah. is actually a lot. That's Google TV, isn't it? Oh, my friend Rob uh, from my damn channel. They signed a deal too, live. Oh, Rob Burnett, uh, CBS guy. Uh, I guess you could subscribe and you could sign up to watch the live feed, but... If they're doing this, this is a direct response to the cable industry. Yeah. Because if you could get, you know, your live programming, Motor Trend, uh, different comedy stuff, and a couple tech stuff, and I think Al Jazeera has signed up with them too. So you're getting major networks, you're getting major companies. Well, Al Jazeera is actually very interesting because I think, uh, well, I don't know if this has changed, but originally there were only two cable networks in the... United States that were even offering. Yeah, nobody was offering Al Jazeera. But but if you could get if, if you want to guess, oh Paul, they, Paul, you broke up. What was that? Well, I was gonna say if, if you want to see that content and you could get it online, that would be one of those another area where you know the internet is out innovating. 
you know, yeah, cable traditional yeah. cable. I mean, it's so this stuff is so old school. I mean, these are the guys they fought, you know, they fight everything They're like the car industry. You know, they fight every innovation they can. Well, they don't want it because it, it kind of interferes in their model. Right. In the way that they make money in the way that they do business. Yep. Yeah, this looks pretty good, actually, what they're doing. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm hoping that it works. Unlike other things. I mean, we've seen it happen. We've seen the live programming happen, but you yeah. have to also put into consideration that many people cannot watch the, this content streaming live. I'm kind of laughing because the truth is like technology never really works. You know, no, <laughs> it's like it's so lousy. But that's why that's why it hasn't. You know, you look at why a cable, you know, the cable systems suck. That's why, you know, the the on demand systems and it, it's just archaic and it looks awful, but they kind of have to be that way because that's what actually works. For, I guess, most people who knows. It's like rim. Yeah, <laughs> you, you're, you stick See? with it because that's what See? you're used to. And that, that might be the answer. Yeah. It's like it's, rim. Not a, it's not a good business model. It, yeah. All right. We got to wrap it up now. Already. My dog is is starting to act up and. I think it, my, my trigger finger is getting a little itchy too. Yeah. So. Uh, go to our website, guysfromqueens.com. Also, go to stream inside gfqlive.tv. You could join our chat and chat with us. Uh, you could also send us an email at guysfromqueens at gmail.com. Did I say that? I said that twice. Where can we do that? Uh, no, guysfromqueens at gmail.com. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you can check out Paul every Thursday on Windows Weekly on the Twit Network. Also, check out his site. Great stuff on his site. I check it out every day almost. Yes, I didn't blog, but uh, you did today. A little, busy yesterday. a little busy at uh, winsupersite.com. Also follow Paul on Twitter at uh, Therot. At Therot. No Paul. No, no Paul. No Paul. Just Therot. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And we'll see you all next week on What the Tech. Good night, everybody.